The hoard was huge and packed with beautifully crafted artifacts from one of the darkest parts of the Dark Ages. But what did it actually tell us? Can one lucky find really revolutionize our thinking of Anglo-Saxon England? And is it so significant that our history of the Dark Age Midlands will now have to be completely rewritten? To find out, I'm going to travel across what was once the Kingdom of Mercia to see if the Horde really lives up to the hype. My journey starts here in Tamworth. We know that in the middle of the 7th century, which is about when the Horde was buried, Tamworth was at the very heart of Mercian royal power. The mighty Mercian kings would fight their enemies, beating off invasion or trying to expand their empire, and then they'd return here to Tamworth to sign treaties and charters, and of course reward their loyal followers and warriors with gold. And today, Tamworth Castle stares down at what was the heart of this royal estate. Even before the Horde was found, historians thought they had a pretty good idea of the importance of Tamworth and of the kind of people who lived here. The royal court wasn't a group of delicate people all wearing silk and satin and posing. It was a warrior band. The, the warrior elite surrounding the king lived and died with him. If he succeeded, they got pots of gold, pots of land, pots of women, lots and lots of nice horses, and life was great. Um, if the king failed, they died horribly. <laughs> Yeah. Well, actually, if we come out um, um, up onto the tower, you get a fantastic sense of, oh, the, wow. of the setting of, of, of Tamworth and why it was such a special place, why it was so important. Um, That's gorgeous, isn't it? It is stunning, isn't it? Yeah. And you can see the castle's a very strategic spot. We're looking out all that would sort of dominate all this ground here, don't we? And, of course, the river crossing there. Marion Blockley is an archaeologist and an expert in Anglo-Saxon history. For her, the hoard is further proof of the wealth and the power of Tamworth. So this is a, a major British yeah. royal settlement. I mean, Absolutely. it's as important as anywhere else in the, in the whole of the modern UK. Definitely. I mean, I worked in Canterbury, I worked in York and many other places. And, and I have this feeling, poor Tamworth, it, it tends to feel neglected, but actually it was exceptionally significant. More um, charters were signed here at important times of the year, at Christmas, at Easter. The royal court travelled around and Tamworth was the place they wanted to be. The hoard was discovered just a few miles from where we're standing. And for Marion, it might just provide proof of a very specific event in the Dark Age Midlands. How any ideas how it might have got there? Nearby, two miles away, was a battle, a famous battle, um, where two kings, Morvael and Cunclan, were involved in a battle with the Britons. And it's possible, as they fled, that they may have um, taken the hoard with them and buried it, hoping to come back. Sadly, they were killed. So that's tantalising. That, Isn't that it? That mm. might be, and it, uh, what record do we have of that battle? There's a 9th century lament. The sister of Cunclan laments his death. Before Luitkoit they triumphed. There was blood beneath the ravens and fierce attack. Glory in battle, great plunder. Before Kayak Luitkoit, Morvile took it. That's really rather wonderful, isn't it? To think that actually might be something to yeah. do with the hordes, very exciting. Isn't that it? is quite exciting. I mean, I'm not saying it's true, but, you know, it may well be. This could be a rare, teasing moment of clarity in a very murky history. The trouble is that this poem was written around 200 years later than we can date anything in the horde. And battles like this weren't exactly rare. Turf wars were an everyday feature of Anglo-Saxon life. We can understand it now, I think, better than it's ever been possible since because we have gangland culture back in Britain. It's gang warfare. And you know, what happens is when you take over the territory of a rival gang, the lot get bumped off, usually in extraordinarily unpleasant ways. So claiming the horde is proof of one particular battle might be pushing it. But put it together with other Anglo-Saxon evidence from across Britain, and it's some of the clearest evidence yet that even in the 7th century, Mercia was a wealthy, powerful and expanding kingdom. Mercian kings at this moment were the winners. And so you see little kingdoms to the west, bigger kingdoms to the east are sucked and absorbed. First of all, you roll Northumbria back, then you take over uh, uh, lands towards Wales and, the, and the, the Welsh marches. Then, of course, 
the Mercians absorb Kent, they absorb London, they swing over into East Anglia. So you're creating this huge middle kingdom. By the um, 8th, 9th century, Mercia is certainly the largest kingdom geographically. It covers the largest portion of, of the British Isles in that respect. But what about the warriors who carved out this vast kingdom? What does the horde tell us about them? And, and so these are, these are pommels for the, for the top of the sword, are they? That's right. They're, they're highly decorative, and th that also is a, is a different sort of pommel. I mean, the stunning thing is that there are more than 90 of these in this horde. I mean, I couldn't believe it. You know, I've spent 30 years digging Anglo-Saxon sites, finding one or two of these objects. And to see some, literally my jaw drop, this quantity of swords is quite remarkable. Until now, only a handful of pummel caps have ever been found anywhere in Britain. Finding 94 in one place suggests the Mercians were the unrivaled military force of their day. But it's not just the number of pommel caps that's important. It's the way they're decorated and what they're decorated with. What we may have here is that these elements of decoration are the sort of personalization of the sword, that the blade will be passed from one warrior to another. These garnets probably came from uh, India or Sri Lanka. And we can do research on the, I mean, the fascinating, it's very likely that very early on in the period, large garnets came from India and Sri Lanka. Later on, when the trade routes broke down, they had smaller garnets, which were coming from places like Portugal and Bohemia. So you're looking at um, a remarkable um, international trade in this stuff. Globalisation. Globalisation. These garnets are real evidence that far from being an insular island race, Anglo-Saxons were actually connected to trade routes all over the world. And it seems, when the warriors got hold of these precious stones, they placed them on the items most precious to them, their weapons. Their sword was their battle friend. They gave names to their sword. We all know about Excalibur. My favourite sword, Excalibur. Well, these swords were symbolic of the power of a great warrior. Absolutely exquisite. It's a work of art on a weapon for killing people. Mm. Quite incredible, really. Yes. So the hoard is positive proof of the power of Mercia. It tells us how rich they were, that they're involved in global trade, and that they liked a good fight. But can the hoard go one step further and connect us to the most famous of all the Mercian kings, Penda? <laughs> We all 